it is it is being recorded good yes and we're going to put it out onto Facebook here in just, just a second. So, I just want brisket mac and cheese. Yeah. How is it? Oh my God. That's my, that's my comfort food. Whenever I have like a surgery or a crisis or an emotional meltdown, that's it. Good, good. Yes, it provides a lot of love and comfort. <laughs> Just like this. This is my Ooh. love. <laughs> what is that? This is uh, Meet the Flockers. It's a hazy IPA from Liquid Gravity. Oh, that's your jam? Ooh. Pouring myself a couple of, of my favorite barbecue pairings. I got a, a good Look. beer and a good wine. Nice. This is me on the beach in the Bahamas on our, on our VO. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Right. The, the Hewitts are back. It looks like a lot of our uh, longtime uh, viewers are here. Uh, the Everwines, we've got Mike Wilkie and Nancy Gillis again, Pam Barnes, Paul Maynard, Steve Hewitt, of course. Steve and Martha, they're saying they're joining us, of course, from Columbus, Ohio, torrential rain yeah. to be ending. Oh. You're going to have the rain. Send <laughs> it over. On, huh? it over. Yeah, we'll take it. Oh, yeah, we would be definitely, especially last week. Holy cow. And it uh, looks like they have a 17 Lan Rouge uh, from McPrice Myers. So, nice. Beauty. Yeah. That's great. Good wine. Yummy wine from our friends there. I had uh, some of the beautiful earth last night at our uh, member meeting. Uh, somebody brought one of those and uh, it, there's some new packaging on it, and it, it's still such a delicious wine. It's so good. They make yeah, it. Mac knows what he's doing. Yeah, he does, definitely. So cool. We'll wait a second here and allow Facebook to catch up to us, so that way we have a little bit of an audience. I don't want to stop you guys from chatting, though. Oh, uh, yeah. Can we see how many people are joining us here? Uh, well, over, uh, over here on this side, it looks like we have seven. Uh, but uh, I am awaiting numbers from the Facebook side of things here in just a minute. But Cheers, Mikey. Uh, hi, Steve. There we go. I do enjoy how everybody does enjoy, uh, pop open a Paso wine during the show. That's always awesome. So that's very cool. Good job, everyone. Are there other options? <laughs> <laughs> you know, some people brought uh, other area wines to... to um, uh, the barbecue last night, or I'm sorry, the member meeting last night. Um, we had a member, everyone watching just before the show gets started, we had a member, our membership, annual membership meeting uh, yesterday over at Vina Robles. And uh, uh, the way we do that is, is uh, everybody att in attendance brings a bottle of wine to share. And then we have an open bar where it's a self pour. Uh, and so we'll probably have, I think, maybe four cases, five cases or so of wines that as the night rolls on, everything gets opened and everybody enjoys. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty fun. And, yeah, uh, and it's, we call that a bottle share. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's yeah. pretty, pretty easy thing and you get to try a lot of wines. And sometimes some members who are not wineries bring a bottle of wine because we say bring a bottle of wine. They'll bring something maybe out of area. And that's kind of fun too, because maybe you'll get to try something unique and different from Sonoma or Santa Barbara, Monterey, wherever. You never know. Great. Sometimes international wines. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're sometimes they're you get a good turnout for the meeting. Mm -hmm. We had 150 people or so. So oh, that's great. <laughs> How do you get invited to that event? You have to be a member of our organization, and you, you're likely some you know local, uh, and uh, and then you get invited because it's an open invitation to anybody who is a member of the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance. So, and it's our annual membership meeting, and so we talk about. Things that you know what we're what we've done so far in the year. Uh, we have soapboxes, so some members get to say you know hello and who they are and what they did and uh, and what they do and you know kind of like a live commercial. Mm -hmm. uh, we do our annual community uh, awards, so we have we recognize some, some people in our industry that uh, get like the Good Neighbor Award or the Master Marketer or um, 
I forgot the third one that we did last night. Whoops. Uh, so anyway, we, we do the awards and then, um, oh, Unsung Hero. That was the other one. And then uh, we have a keynote speaker of some sort. Last night was an HR professional talking a little bit about the you know status of HR right now. And, uh, and then after that, we party and we have tacos and wine because that's what we do in Paso. All right, right on. So we have uh, plenty of people over on the Facebook side of things. I think we're somewhere around uh, maybe... I'm a little late with this, but we got to, we were at 20 ish. Uh, so we're probably at 30 ish by now and probably more climbing as we go. So let's start. Uh, hey, everyone, Chris Toronto with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance and the Paso Wine Hour. Thank you again for joining us for another fun show. Today's show, we are talking about barbecue, but we're going to get into a lot of the kind of almost semantics of barbecue as well as we go. We'll talk about wine, we'll talk about what we do here in Paso. But first, let's say hello to uh, some of our panelists. Love for them to introduce themselves, who they're with. Just a quick hello. So Bridget Bins. Hello, Bridget. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for joining us. I am uh, Bridget Bins, and I'm a cookbook author. I've written a whole ton of cookbooks. Some of them are here, but I wouldn't be able to see me if I had all of them here. Um, this is my first one in 92, and this is my latest one just recently, but oh, along that. the way, I've worked with Weber Grills developing about 400 recipes for um, various books like this, where there's my name is not on the cover, but it's in the thank you inside. Um, and then I also work with this crazy guy who Jeffrey has met, Meathead, yeah. the cool. fabulous amazingribs.com. And I've been working with him for a couple of years now on a huge book called The Art of Barbecue. But he's also kind of a specialist in sous vide Q. So I kind of want to touch on that today. And I own a vacation rental in Paso called Refugio Paso Robles with my husband, AKA Paso Wineman. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, the first time I met Bridget was with, through Casey, actually, when we were developing Paso Wine Man uh, some years ago. And um, I got to taste test some things when she was uh, working with us, a new Weber. I remember it was like a brand new Weber that you were doing. And, and you had uh, Jenny and I over and we got to taste test through some, some recipes. That was really fun. Uh, Tyler Russell with Cordon Nell. What's up, Tyler? Hey, guys. How's it going? Yeah, so my name is Tyler Russell, as we said, from Cordonnell Winery, owner winemaker. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah. Google it Tyler's if you want to know more. been on the show before. Actually, I yeah. think Tyler was one of my very first guests on the very first Paso Wine Hour. So welcome back. Uh, Thank you. On this. It's, it's... This is my third appearance. <laughs> and then Jeffrey, Jeffrey Weisinger with uh, Wine Country Barbecue. Hey, guys. Cheers. Uh, I'm here at the restaurants here, so you might have, have a little uh, background noise, but uh, for those of us join, those of you joining us that uh, may not know, my name's Jeff Wiesinger, chef, pit master, sommelier, and owner of Jeffrey's Wine Country Barbecue. We're tucked away here in the Norman's Way Alley in, in downtown Paso. Uh, we just celebrated our three-year anniversary. Fond yeah. Season. Stoked. Made it through. Congratulations. Uh, pandemics and uh, yeah it means means a lot for us to to be open and and we're a we're a barbecue restaurant but we're not just uh, any barbecue restaurant we're a, i call it wine country barbecue uh it is the art of low and slow cooking uh but at the same time we also do some cool globally influenced kind of things uh, paella is one of the signature dishes and i always kind of uh, attributed paella to a, a version of barbecue it's uh usually cooked outdoors. It could be on gas. It could be over charcoal, but uh, we'll, we'll touch on that uh, later on. But thanks everybody for joining us. Hope you got some, something nice in your glass. Wait, are you drinking beer do. or wine? Oh, wait. He's double fisted. <laughs> That's the way all proper awesome. chefs do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, right on everyone. So yes, we're doing the barbecue show and, and what we we're going to, and like I said, we're going to get into a little bit of the definition of barbecue, definition of grilling and the like here in just a minute. But I thought what better time to do it as we're walking into uh, the holiday weekend being the 4th of July, where everybody gets out there and I mean, how best to celebrate our, our nation's uh, independence, but to 
get together with family, especially now that we're able to once again get together and, and feel confident and 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 everything about being able to be around people, grill something up, eat some good food, drink some good wine together, and just enjoy each other's company. And so let's start this conversation out though with some some definition. We, we talk barbecue, we talk grilling. Let's talk first, before we get into the difference of the two, let's talk about barbecue and let's define barbecue a little bit better because American regional barbecue can come in many different forms. And I was hoping, Jeff, you could enlighten us a little bit on some of like, what's the difference between say uh, St. Louis, not San Louis, but St. Louis barbecue versus Kansas City versus Santa Maria versus all of those things. Give us the one, two. Yeah, American regional barbecue is a is something I'm super passionate about. I've, I've gotten really into over the years, uh, you know, and that, and that segues into I think maybe the first topic is the difference between what what is barbecue versus what is what is grilling. Uh, when we're talking about barbecue, we're talking low and slow, enclosed in a smoker. Uh, you know, barbecue is kind of a, a generic global culinary term you know it's it is a term that's used all around all around the world usually having to do with cooking over over fire uh, but true American barbecue is originated Texas pretty much gets gets the nod man they, they were a you know they're that region kind of originated low and slow cooking over oak over charcoal indirect heat temperature ranges between 180 225 degrees you know well under the 300 degree mark which is a uh, when you start you'll start getting into the world of uh, of grilling and above and then when you talk about american regional barbecue i'm going to start with california here we are in california uh, our style of barbecue is really unique to the rest of the country uh tri-tip is our signature barbecue item now you take uh, you take a tri-tip and you bring it to any other part of the country and they're going to look at you funny. Uh, tri-tip is as native to California as brisket is to Texas. Uh, Texas is all about brisket. Uh, it's the, the front part of the cow. It's really tough if it's not cooked right. Uh, so it's got to be cooked low and slow. Uh, a good brisket is, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours in order to get it till it's tender enough to, to really enjoy. Talk about St. Louis, one of my favorite examples. Uh, St. Louis is known for their ribs. Uh, they're so well known for their pork ribs specifically that there's a cut of rib called the St. Louis, the St. Louis rib. Uh, it is trimmed off from the spare rib. So a lot of people are familiar with uh, baby back ribs and then there's spare ribs, and then there's St. Louis cut spare ribs. And the St. Louis uh, are the ones that we specialize here at the restaurant. Uh, but, it, you know, so that, there, there's three major regions that I think uh, the, the next biggest region would be the Carolinas. And that's when you get into whole hog. Uh, it's predominantly pork. It's predominantly whole hog barbecue. Uh, Carolinas, that, that region, that, that kind of southeastern region is what really they specialize in whole pork, uh, taking a whole pig, and smoking it low and slow, and they chop that whole thing up. Mm. Here at our restaurant, we uh, use the pork butt, which is kind of the traditional cut. But yeah, between between tri-tip on the West Coast, then you get into the Midwest and the pork ribs, uh, they do they, they dabble in beef ribs too, and then you go down to Texas, and then you go over to uh, the Carolinas to get your pulled pork. That's kind of the, the barbecue belt, if you ask me. And so Jeff, did, did uh, barbacoa from south of the border influence the tradition in Texas? Barbacoa being pit barbecue, like the authentic, authentic style of digging a hole in the ground and putting your meat in there. Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, that's maybe the original, original sense of, of what true global barbecue was, you know, before the advent of uh, metal and smokers and whatnot, you know, the, uh, the Native Americans, the, the Native people around uh, all, sort, all parts of the world were digging holes in the ground, building their fire, letting their fire uh, turn into coals, and then getting it on there. Yeah, barbacoa is some of the best, and traditionally, that's goat, and traditionally, it's got to be cooked in the ground. Huh, cool. That's really interesting. Texas, I know I've had my fair share of really good 
uh, barbecue uh, from Texas uh, and, and seen like been out to like the Salt Lake outside of Austin where, you know, they have that big pit in the center of the restaurant with the big hood and, you know, fire going and all that. I've been to Pecan Lodge. I've been to a bunch of those places where it's just, it's so, it's such a Texas thing. It's amazing. So speaking of fire. When we first opened the restaurant, uh, we got into, we went, to, took a trip down to Texas and, and off, off, it was great. Such an amazing experience. And it was really part of the influence of what we, you know, what influenced me to expand our menu. But uh, I like that you mentioned the Salt Lake specifically. Uh, there's some Paso winemaker connections that we have at the Salt Lake. Uh, that was the only place I was able to taste another pass of wine from a, our good friend Don Brady, who's the winemaker at uh, Robert Hall. Don's got his own label. And if you go to the Salt Lake Barbecue, there's a tasting room right next door where you can taste all of their Texas uh, wines and one pass of wine made by Don. It was that's cool. amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So let's talk now the difference between barbecue and grilling. I want to toss this one over uh, to Bridget, who's, as she mentioned, she's she's made a lot of cookbooks. I think if she put them all there next to her, it would definitely be taller than her. <laughs> but Bridget, take it away. Let's talk a little bit about that that difference of grilling versus barbecue. Well, Jim, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but and I certainly could be, but to me, grilling um, is a dry heat. Um, it's, it does also in, include low and slow, but you usually are doing the low and slow either before you sear it or after you sear it. And those are choices that you make, but we don't put, in grilling, you don't normally put sauce on the meat as it cooks. So you want a dry environment for your searing. And so to me, that's, that's how I think of grilling as opposed to barbecue. You don't see um, tomato-based sauces and vinegar. I mean, you have vinegar, but, but that's my, my take. Low and slow would be, in my case, in the grilling case, would be a reverse sear. And so the point of a reverse sear is that you cook the, do the low and slow cooking either in a smoker or in a sous vide bag, there's one, um, or in the oven if you, if you must, get it to the temperature, basically to the temperature that you want for your final interior temperature and then you take it out and sear the crap out of it and get a crust, a beautiful, dark, caramelized crust on the outside of the protein. And the benefit with sous vide, which you can do in your oven or in your smoker, is set it to the temperature that you want approximately your final protein to be like usually 131 and take it away until it reaches in sous vide. That usually takes, depending on how thick it is, a couple of hours. You get, you don't get the stripes that you do with a regular sear and slide type of grilling, which is what most backyard daddios used to do in the 50s and 60s. They would do the sear and slide. And then you end up with brown on the top and the bottom, then a layer of more kind of grayish brown, then like a pale pink, a strip of red in the middle, and then the opposite going down to the bottom. But if you do the reverse sear, you end up with your 131 degrees top to bottom. So it's an even beautiful pink all the way through. And then you take it back and sear it. And I just want to show a little, I mean, for those people who are really um, ambitious, backyard daddios, start your chimney. Tyler, you've done this? I no, I'm you. a backyard daddio. That's oh, you're the that's backyard yeah. daddio. Awesome. Yeah. Um, light your coals in here, right? As if you were starting your charcoal Weber and get them flaming like crazy and then put a grill on top of there, oil your, your low and slow reverse seared steak or whatever protein you're doing and then slap it on top of here. And that's why Meathead calls this the afterburner method because it is, and you got to see him with three of them, running three of them at the same time. Um, I'm gonna, in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about board sauces, but that was the main thing that I wanted to touch on is the combination of sous vide and grilling. He calls it yeah. sous vide cube, but it's basically, you're taking your protein, cooking it underwater in your bag until it gets to the temperature you want, 
and then finishing it over hot, hot coals so you get that beautiful caramelization. That's awesome. Uh, I, I got to try one of those, actually, one of these days soon. I got to get one of those. So let's talk about backyard daddios. Uh, Tyler now uh, identifying himself as one. And I, I'll tell everybody bef just before the shutdown, I had a group of journalists in town and we were going to go to dinner. We had reservations and everything at one place. Unfortunately, uh, they, they couldn't accommodate us at the last minute. Uh, and so we very quickly, very Paso style, Threw together a little cue, if you will, over at Tyler's place, where he and Stanley Bar Barrios from uh, Top Winery uh, turned out to be our chefs for the evening, and they grilled up a massive feast that was so incredible that everybody, every journalist there, was like, "Do they do this professionally?" <laughs> Truly, for the right I mean, price. Really thought, yeah. I mean, not only that, but your board, your presentation was insane. It was off the hook too. Tyler, you marry wine and food, basically. And I'm curious, I mean, I have so many questions for you, but I mean, which comes first when you're, you set out to grill something? Is it what's going to go with a certain wine or is then the wine chosen after? No, basically how it works is a few of us get together. We say there's 10 of us. We, there's going to be 20 bottles of wine. And the first thing that happens is most of those bottles just get opened up. Because if you, you, when you show up, you bring your two bottles, you open them and put them on the table. We don't really just pair one wine. Like, it's not like, oh, this is the wine we're going to drink tonight with what we're grilling. We have 20 wines to choose from throughout the night that we maybe sample while we're cooking, sample while we're socializing as people arrive. And then by the time the food's ready, you just grab the bottles and put them on the table and just keep doing that. Like, there's no... There's no reason to only drink one wine. Like the, the beautiful thing about grilling is that it's a social setting. It's like, I don't fire up my grill when it's just me very seldomly. Uh, but when I fire my grill, it's like, it's an event. And so people show up and it, it's not about like this food with this wine. It's just all the food and all the wine and all the people all at once. It's more of a hedonistic kind of way to do things. I mean, cooking on fire is that it's hedonistic and that's a beautiful thing about it that primitive element about it that's why i like grilling so much is taking a bed of hot coals and taking beef and chicken or pork whatever and vegetables and all the things fish and just turning it into a feast which is fire and raw ingredients and that's why it's such an amazing thing and that's why you can't just pair one wine with it because there's so many different things going on there's so many different flavors to enjoy you have to have an array of wines to really do it right and so Chris, that's kind of how I feel about the wine and food part about it. Chris, there, there, there are wines that have a, a smoky element to them, right? Um, not not yeah. because it's near a wildfire, but because of the great variety and how it's, but would that be something that you would think about putting together if you did want to do a specific pairing? Honestly, Bridger, Bridger, I, I, I give no thought to pairing almost any of the time. I just drink as good bottle of wine and eat good food. And it usually works. Like there's some rules of thumb and spices and things like that mm -hmm. that you take into consideration. But I mean, especially if the wines are predominantly Paso wines, they're pretty sizable generally. And so that kind of goes with the the barbecue or grilled meats and grilled veggies kind of element that might be challenging for maybe if you're trying to drink more delicate wines uh, per se. But for the most part, just open more wines than you need and make more food than you need. And it just kind of works out. <laughs> but it probably wouldn't be a Pinot Noir then, right? Oh, hell yeah, there's Pinot Noirs on the there table. There better yeah. be a Pinot Noir there yeah. if you're having a bar. Yeah. That's probably yeah, what you start we... with. <laughs> yeah. In the social I mean, part. I don't know. I, uh, I just operate like in this. On, on that pairing aspect of it, if, if I may, uh, when it comes to pairing barbecue and talking about wines, I go to a varietal that is a variety of wine that's not typically my, my favorite on its own. Uh, we make some good good ones here in Paso, but it's Zinfandel. Zinfandel and barbecue, low and slow, and specifically when you're talking like tomato-based or barbecue sauces, uh, Zinfandel is one of my favorite wine and barbecue pairings because it doesn't have the maybe complexities that you're going to get from some of these other wines. So it's you're going to get uh, you know good Zinfandels for, for me from Paso Robles. Uh, I have one in my glass right now. This is from Thatcher Winery. Uh, Sherman and his team make a fantastic Zinfandel that I think pairs really well with, with barbecue because of the fruit aspect of it, the fruit component. You have a nice balance of fruit and acid. Uh, 
the tannin structure of, of the wine is not, it's, it's not really a big tannic wine. So that kind of allows the, uh, the crust that you were mentioning, uh, Bridget, or uh, as we barbecue geeks we are familiar with the Maillard reaction. The, yeah. Maillard, the Maillard reaction is the term, uh, it's the uh, scientific process of browning, browning meat. So anytime you start to get that char or even in low and slow, you'll still get that Maillard re uh, reaction or the amino acids will begin to caramelize and create that fantastic crust. And I'm going to be looking for a wine or a beer that's going to be able to kind of, um, you know, match up with that. Not, not to, you don't need the smoky component of it. You need more of the fruit, some of the acid uh, in there. And it's Zin. Zin Zin's my go-to if we're, if we're having a barbecue. But yeah, there better be a Pinot, there better be a Cab, there better be a, all, of them. all of the above. We don't open them all. Yes. Well, like, we're I don't also, so there better be a Syrah. There's going to be Syrah, there's going to be Gia, there's going to be, and and space wine. There'll be Yeah, there'll be some brewskis and maybe some other things that maybe we shouldn't mention. But the point That's is, the like, <laughs> in the backyard, with the backyard daddy, there are no rules. Hey, there... What happened? Where'd you go? Austin. Oh, there he is. Oh, here we are. Yeah, saying there's no rules in the backyard. You just do, do it all. Unless, yeah. unless you're mowing your lawn with no clothes on. Well, if it's the backyard, it doesn't. There's no law. There's yeah, no did rules. Did you see that? Just no, I didn't. Bad. Yeah, somebody got the police came because somebody in the Tascadero was mowing his front lawn totally naked, and he didn't think that anybody could see him from the road. Really, I mean, it's totally fine. It's just that someone complained. But why would you even complain? I mean, I would celebrate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why not? Oh, it's always fun how this show uh, well, can digress in fun ways. <laughs> Bridget, while we've got you, uh, let's talk a little bit about when it comes to creating. Now, you were talking about board sauces a second ago, but before we go there, I'm really curious. Can red wine in particular be used in some way, shape or form, whether it's a marinade or something like that? with meat that it can maybe enhance its cooking, enhance maybe that that process of, of that crispy bit as we've talked about in the past and things like that. Talk a little bit about that and, and then transition into board sauces. Okay, um, 100%, you can absolutely use red wine as a marinade. And one of the first things I ever did was a, a butterfly um, leg of lamb that was marinated for two, three days in a combination of, of red wine and olive oil. The only, and it, it, it gets a little purple on the edge, which is no problem because you're gonna now, you won't see that because you got the crust on it, the Maillard reaction. Uh, the only issue is that you must, if you're gonna use a marinade with anything that will be grilled, you must make absolutely certain that the protein is totally dry before you put it mm. over the high heat. Because if you don't dry it out, it's gonna simmer steam and end up gray. So in order to create the Maillard reaction, the crust, you got to pat it dry, you know, with either paper towels or your very clean kitchen towels and get all of that moisture off of it. And then put a slick of oil on there to promote the browning. And whether you have, you probably did not dry brine in this case, because that's a, that's basically a wet brine. Dry brine, you don't need to worry so much, but if you dry brine by putting salt on your protein and letting it hang out for a couple hours, if it's small, a day, if it's large, you still do have to pat it dry because the salt will pull moisture up out of the protein to the surface and you get little beads. And so again, you don't want to steam it, you want to sear it. So it's great, it's amazing. Um, I used to work for a woman in LA named Evan Kleiman who owned all the Angeli restaurants and also does the good food show on KCRW. And I invited her over one time and I said, I've been marinating this lamb. Um, I didn't use all of it. And so this, these cubes have now been in the red wine uh, soak for three days. It, it might be too much. And she said, no, it'll be amazing. And it was amazing. So you just, it does denature, break down the surface a little bit, but as long as you pat it dry, you will be golden and you'll have beautiful flavor. Is there, is there a, I mean, do you want a more tannic wine versus say a more fruity? I mean, is there a certain wine that works best? I almost always use Zinfandel when I do something like that. 
So in the glass and on the protein, um, I think is a good is a good plan. Part of that is because I want that fruitier nature and I don't want the tannins, but I don't know from a scientific standpoint, Jeff, maybe you know whether, would there be an issue, Tyler, would there be an issue with having tannins in the wine affecting the protein? I have never noticed tannin structure in a wine translate over into meat when we're when we're marinating anything uh, you know they, they say make sure that you are when what you're going to cook with is something that you're going to drink and uh as much as i'm a big proponent of that in general uh i want i don't want what's necessarily in my marinade to be something that's necessarily going to be in my glass right away so like i love i love a good tannic wine and that's what i'm going to have in my glass what i'm going to put in my marinade yeah, it's, it's going to be something that's going to have bring more fruit components and the fruit flavors, they do. Um, I, I think they do translate over. Now, I also reduce wine into my barbecue sauce. And when you reduce the wine, uh, you get some more just concentrated flavors. And I think it adds a great layer of flavor to a barbecue sauce to, to combine the sweetness and the smokiness and some of the... Uh, you know, the seasonings that we're going to use, smoked paprika and granulated garlic and, uh, and black pepper, you know, and some of the, the standards. You know, one of my go-to sauces for anything really, but mostly grilled stuff, is to um, mince up a shallot, reduce it in a little pan with some red wine until it's syrupy, and then just beat in some cold butter. And Bob's your uncle. I mean, you are very happy now. You can put that on anything, fish, chicken, steak. It's, it's a beautiful... It's a beautiful thing. It's super easy. And we cook awesome. we cook with wine that we're willing to drink, right? Tyler, you were going to say something, but but I'll toss that to you as well. Um, I guess. I mean, I don't actually cook with wine that much. I I um my go-to for grilled meats is usually like a chimichurri or romesco sauce or something like that. And so I go a little bit more in that direction. I actually think that suits this area more. I think that's kind of like the things that would, if we let them would grow really well here and would thrive here. And so I kind of lean more to those kind of more Mediterranean-ish kind of, of ways of doing things. Uh, we do live in a Mediterranean climate, so it, those, those flavors really inspire me. So I kind of stick to that kind of stuff. But I mean, I cook with wine, I would say like, uh, I make like beef cheek stew or whatever, or, um, stuff like that, more brave for like a braising liquid. I, almost, I use wine almost all the time. Not so much when I grill though. But I would never use a Thatcher's Infidel to marinate something in. I mean, that's. I mean, a little for me, a little for like I'll yeah. I'll, I'll marinate with whatever's yeah. open, but like meat. if it's not taking yeah. the whole bottle, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's a good thing to do if you got a wine. Maybe it's been open three or four days that you don't want to dump down the drain, but you're going to cook like those kind of wine. Like yeah. that's perfectly good uh, yeah. cooking wine still at that point, and so that's something to consider. I think that's really smart. And that's usually how I end up with my red wine and shallot thing is that it's left over. Yeah, whatever though. This but would, you know, chili, maybe a glass left, glass left in the is bottle. The, is the gold standard for me. And should I, can I go into the board sauce thing? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Please do, yeah. So um, you need a board. <laughs> and the bigger the board, the better. This one is practically not big enough. But what you can do I like um, like a 24, 18 by 24 board. If you can, you can go to, if you have a hardwood place in your community, like Mayan Hardwoods in Paso, you can go over there and get a piece of butcher block. Whatever size you want, they'll cut it for you. Because you need, you need elbow room, you need room to move. But basically the idea is that instead of creating a sauce ahead of time, you create the sauce on the board and then the finished steak or other kind of protein goes onto the board with a bunch of groovy stuff. Um, your, your constants would be salt. This is lemon flake salt from um, the meadow and pepper and olive oil and fresh herbs. Those are the kind of the basic building blocks of your board sauce, but then you want to get creative and you're putting everything on, it's basically like a Jackson Pollock painting. So you're creating this amazing scape on your, on your big board and put all the stuff on there, chop it up, basil, flat leaf parsley, um, capers, something that I often put on there. You can put on some black olives. We're staying Mediterranean now. Um, 
And then after you get your chopped stuff on there, and I usually do garlic, shallot, and instead of mincing them, I grate them because you want them to be really, really fine and meld into when you eventually bring the sauce together. At first, you're doing the Jackson Pollock. So you get all the little things individually on there. And then you start chop, 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 bringing it together. Um, if you wanted a different flavor profile, I, I wouldn't mind adding some mustard to it. If you wanted, for whatever reason, to do an Asian flavor profile, you could put some chili crisp type of stuff. This is dobanjang. Um, you could also put some sun-dried tomatoes on there. The important thing is that it's all minced up really small, and then you smush it around with your bench scraper or however you want to do that, and then you place your protein on there, your finished cooked protein. You slice it, and then you swish your slices through all the goodness that you have created. It's really important to have a lot of green herbs on there. It looks so beautiful and it perks everything up. Oregano, because now you've got the little chimichurri thing going on there, red pepper flakes. So just think about what the flavors that you would wanna have. And then there it all is on your board. I think a lot of people don't want a big honk and steak anymore. I mean, once in a while, maybe when I'm alone, but a lot of times you want to slice it, dredge those slices in the goodness, and then serve them to serve everybody three, four, five, six slices that's all coated with all this, plenty of olive oil, right? And then at the very end, to balance that um, richness, you want some kind of acid in it. So whether it's, um, you know, you, you, you zest your, your lemon, put some lemon zest in there, throw a little actual lemon juice in there, or I'm not a huge fan of balsamic vinegar all the time, but this is a great time to use a good balsamic. Just a few drops. Now you're getting really Jackson Pollock-esque because you got the olive oil, you got the herbs, and you have the little droplets of the balsamic, and you just swish it all around and you got very happy slices. Oh my gosh, I am so hungry right now. That is ridiculous. <laughs> I know, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be good over here. <laughs> Oh, geez. I, you painted a very beautiful picture just now that I, I feel like I could smell and taste. <laughs> and so, and I always want to bring this back to Paso wine and how that goes and how this, for I suppose, even though I think everybody is probably just drooling like I am, but those bold flavors, I think perfectly is in line with the bold flavors of most Paso Robles wines. Wouldn't you say, Tyler? Yeah, no, most definitely. And I think that um, there's not just in barbecuing and grilling, but there's a bold flavors exist in a lot of types of cuisine. And so not Paso Robles isn't is great with barbecue, but it's not exclusive to barbecue, which I think is really important to point out. It goes with a lot of different kinds of food. Um, anything that has any kind of richness, anything that kind of has any kind of like depth to it is going to go great with Paso wine and grilling and barbecue is definitely has more, you know, plenty of depth, plenty of complexity to it especially like with, with barbecuing itself, you know, the different, you just the different kinds of woods you can use can impact the flavor of a wine or mm -hmm. how your temperature, low or hot, colder smokes, hotter smokes. And then grilling, you know, indirect heat over direct heat, they're using mesquite charcoal or using red oak or using briquettes or what have you. I've started using like some uh, small amounts of Japanese charcoal within my brick, within my lump charcoal because it gets super, I can make super hot little pockets all over like really distinct hot spots. So I have like a, I don't know, four, three, three and a half foot, four foot Santa Maria style grill. And so I'll, I, when I make a big bed of coals, I'll make like hot, hotter zones than others. And so I can do different things in different places. And so, you know, all that stuff adds to complexity. All that stuff adds to the flavor. And so Paso Robles wines is really is a testament to the Paso's wines uh, ability to pair with many things because barbecue is a challenge. Uh, for most other regions, I would say, and and Paso Robles does that amongst other things. So, it says a lot about its uh, the diversity of the wines. You know, yeah. I'm intrigued yeah. with the Japanese charcoal, but um, I also wanted to ask Jeff about um, is it North Carolina where there's vinegar in the in the barbecue sauce? Vinegar, yeah. vinegar and mustard, two different. So how, uh, how is that going to affect the wine choice? Is it, or is it beer? Maybe it's beer. 
when you use a vinegar sauce on pork, the fattiness and the richness of the pork complements the vinegar. And it doesn't, in my experience, fight with the wine. And it can, I mean, the, the potential, the potential is there, but uh, when you're doing a vinegar or a mustard based sauce uh, that, that kind of has that, you know, vinegar kind of component to it, uh, you, you know, you gotta be careful, but you, I don't necessarily recommend using it as a finishing sauce, uh, but when you're using it to top your pork and you mix it all in together, the richness of the pork is really complementing and, and working out as opposed to something like this. <laughs> uh, these two of, uh, two of my favorite uh, examples of the barbecue that we do here at the restaurant. Here we have our St. Louis cut low and slow smoked ribs. They're dry rubbed. They, uh, similar to a, a three to one method. Some uh, barbecue pros might understand uh, the, the understand for the three to one method, which uh, typically is considered to be three hours naked, two hours wrapped, one hour sauced. Oh. So a four a four hour cook is, is kind of traditional in the world of ribs. How we get these beauties is uh, we do them naked for four hours and then wrapped for one hour and then we drizzle our sauce on top. Uh, I use my uh, tomato based uh, Texas style tomato based barbecue sauce as a finishing sauce. Same thing here with the tri-tip. That was a good one. Uh, the way we the way we do tri-tip here is a uh, is pretty dynamite. Where we smoke it low and slow. The rest of California grills their tri-tip. Uh, Tyler, I can only imagine that, that you're out there in the at the, at the tasting room. I don't do tri-tip. I refuse because I've had barbecue tri-tip. And once you have a barbecue, you can't go back to grilled tri tip. It's I don't. Hard, think. Could, it's hard to have this and then go. I mean, you, I got to tip my hat to a Firestone Grill down in San Luis Obispo. That is kind of a that's a staple here in, in San Luis Obispo County, and and uh, they do a fantastic job grilling theirs. But uh, it's also barbecue. I, I'm going to circle back to kind of the, the, what we first started talking about: the difference in barbecue and grilling. Uh, and it really comes down to low and slow versus hot and fast. Hot and fast is searing. Hot and fast is grilling to get those nice grill marks. However, you can cook on a grill and still go low and slow and get into the world of barbecue. When you're talking pit barbecue, you, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the salt lick. And uh, you know, here in Santa Maria, uh, Santa Maria, California, being the, the home of California barbecue, there's no there's no doubt that the Santa Maria style is an authentic barbecue, except it's open air uh, because they build the coals, they put it on the grate, and then the grate is able to rise up and down. So when you have that grate really close to the coals, that's when you're grilling, that's when you're searing, uh, that's when you're getting your Maillard reaction you know, really, really quickly. But as soon as you take that Santa Maria grill grate and you raise that up, and you're dealing with some indirect heat. If you got the fire here, or if you have the fire over here, the, the, the traditional indirect heat, you can still get that barbecue action uh, by having that low and slow. And, and barbecue is really the, the one way you will know if your food has been, your meat has been barbecued, is if you have the smoke ring. If there's a smoke ring on your brisket, on your tri-tip, on your ribs, that is a, that's something that you get from low and slow. Although I did learn be a uh, Bridget and I's buddy Meathead, uh, that he has this really cool technique in this uh, sous vide style of barbecue where you can use liquid smoke and, and still get get the smoke ring. But uh, but really, it, it's a smoke ring that you're looking for. It's a little quarter inch, eighth of an inch, quarter inch ring around uh, the inside of your meat, and that's that's what you're looking for. What is what causes that? I mean, I should know. I don't know. What? Well, how does that it, happen? <laughs> Yeah, that's um, that's part of the science. The that's the scientific part of it. That's the uh, amino acid breakdown. That's uh, the the caramelizing of the sugars or meat proteins. That's uh, that's above my pay grade to really uh, explain it in great detail. I can BS my way through it pretty good. Yeah, but, uh, but it looks like what does it look like? Does it look like a, a like a little rainbowish ring around the the quarter? Let me see if I can find it for you. <laughs> Yep, there it is. 
There it is. Awesome. Totally get it. You see that? Uh-huh. I do. That's that's what you want. Cool. Make sure you have it. <laughs> All right, wait really quick. What's everybody drinking? Um, because I, I want to make sure uh, everybody watching uh, is just you know really quickly privy to to what we're we're tasting. So Tyler, what do you have? This is our um, oh, Viognier sorry. that my husband and I make, and that's a picture of me in the Bahamas. That's all you get to see. <laughs> <laughs> is that available for retail, or is that just if you come to and lovely, stay? lovely? It's a, it's a personal thing. We don't sell it. Got it. <laughs> Got it. I'll trade you. Yeah. Tyler. So I'm drinking our uh, our uh, Central Coast Syrah in, in the spirit of barbecue. What's that label? Syrah, like? Is Syrah that? kind of a barbecue-y thing? Uh, Syrah, well, I mean, I, I, Syrah is just powerful, so it goes against anything for the most part. And so, yeah, again, in a roundabout way, yes, but again, amongst other things, it goes well with, yeah. Can Especially if you're doing like ribeyes, like grilled like steaks, ribeyes, or or something like that. It's raw is great. Tyler, show us the label. Oh, I'm pouring out of a shiner. I don't have it's, it's yeah. That's it's not a private stash, so you know that's the ones I keep. Typical. <laughs> Does it have an extra kick to it, Tyler? No, same, just just one thing in there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just grapes. Just grapes. Good. Just grapes. <laughs> Jeff, give a, uh, Tyler, when you have a second, though, show everybody at least a label of what your brand looks like. When you, I'm at home. I don't really have anything. Around oh, here. okay. No worries. Yeah. yeah. Jeff, what are you uh, tasting over there? What I'm tasting over here is some delicious brisket. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, come on. This is, a, this is our low and slow 16-hour smoked brisket paired with our house made pickled onions pickled. Our, house, our house pickled cucumber this this pairing right here of these three dishes uh really take it to a great level of barbecue and then what takes it to the next level is if you get yourself uh so i in in the wine glass i got some of thatcher thatcher zinfandel uh, we get that from a keg in a keg uh oh. thatcher. so it's wow, that's great. pretty that's pretty swanky you get the thatcher zinfandel in a keg that's amazing and I got to tell you, this is this exact flavor profile that I'm looking for to pair my tri-tip sandwich and my ribs and my brisket with. Uh, there is such a great level of fruit, but it's not a fruit bomb. Uh, you have a little bit of the, the typical white pepper, black pepper kind of spice going on. Uh, there's a great bit of a, acidity in this wine. And the tannin structure is just enough to let you know that this is a is a good, you know, well-made, well-made wine. But like I say, I think the fruit really uh, shines in this wine. And then, as I'm grilling, or as I'm smoking, or as I'm barbecuing, I'm enjoying Meet the Flockers. Uh, these are from uh, our friends down at Liquid Gravity Brewing Company down in San Luis Obispo. And Brandon and his team are making some fantastic beers. This is a hazy IPA. Uh, this, you know, when it comes to grilling and, and barbecuing and this time of year being really, really big on that, it's all about what's in your glass. And like Tyler was mentioning before, who's around the pit with you? Uh, do you have, you know, your friends, your family, you're, you're getting everybody together. You're, uh, you're enjoying some cold ones or you're, you're enjoying some, uh, nice wines. Like I tell you what, we got some rosés back here. Uh, my friend Raymond uh, Smith next door here at Indigene Cellars is making a killer rosé the pears ah oh look at you awesome. that's what i'm having the, the indigenous i have two wines open actually but yeah, <laughs> yeah um, what's, what's, I mean, what's the indigenous rosé what's the great from it pinot noir oh lovely very elegant pinot noir rosé uh and if i believe correctly it's a paso robles ava pinot noir pretty sure it is yeah, yeah kind of amazing. Sure it is. Yeah, yeah, and he's got such it's got such a beautiful light color to it. It's it's almost a white wine esque, but going back to the barbecue kind of kind of pairings, it has just enough fruit component. You get that you get that typical strawberry watermelon kind of flavor, uh, but it's a it's a dry wine. There's no sweetness to it. So 
that's what you're looking for to pair with a barbecue sauce because nine times out of 10, your barbecue sauce is either gonna be sweet, smoky, or, or maybe spicy. So when you have all those components taken care of in your food, I don't need to double up on it in the wine. I'm gonna be looking for some other components. When you start talking about Syrah and barbecue, I think it's a more in-depth conversation because are we talking about a cool climate Syrah or a warm climate Syrah? And those two styles, the, the terroir from the regions that you're gonna get these wines from are also gonna change and, and affect the, the style of wine, affect the pairings. But the best thing, I'll, I'll circle back to kind of what Tyler was saying, there is no wine in Paso Robles that's not a good pair with barbecue. I mean, across the board, even your big, even your big dog, beautiful uh, cabs that uh, are grippy on your palate, all you got to do is find something with a little acid to kind of help you strip that. And then you go, you know, go back and forth, have a bite, have a sip, have a bite, have a sip. That, that's whether it's grilling or whether it's barbecue, <clears throat> is there a no-no out there for making it food, like making that food wine friendly specifically? Um, well, I'm going to say, I'm going to say the vinegar, but, then, know, yeah. but what Jeff just said, as long as you're pairing the vinegary sauce with something that nice and fatty like pork, then those things balance themselves out. Uh, it's just spicy. That's a hard one. Spicy is always a hard one with a lot of wines, especially red wine. And so if you're grilling a lot of peppers or maybe you're making carne asada on the grill and you're doing salsas, like maybe that's not the right move to have certain most wines. Um, but yeah, if you're going spicy, that, that makes it a challenge. But again, just open a lot of wines and figure it out as you go. Well, if you went, like if you went with a board sauce that had some of this, this type of thing, Asian stuff in it, the, the banjang or the chili crisp, would you then go with a Riesling type of thing? I mean, I know I'm just going If you have access to good Riesling, yeah, why well, not? I mean, if I have access to good Riesling, I'm opening one every time I open a lot of wines, to be honest, that's, that's delicious wine. Um, so. Yeah, so it's, I guess it's, you... uh, it's uh, there's a Gewürztraminer that's grown here in Paso over on the east side. Um, it's an estate. Uh, it's an estate Gewürztraminer that as it is dry, there's not a great deal of, of sweetness to it, but the minerality uh, that Gewürztraminer can bring to spicy food kind of mimics it. I mean, when you're talking spicy barbecue, you are going to be looking for something that has a little bit of residual sugar to kind of kind of break up that that sweetness. Um, the name is escaping me right now, but uh, Paso Robles is growing so many different kinds of fantastic grapes, and, and there's so many great winemakers in this community that I don't care if you're talking spicy or sweet or, or whatever, there is a wine in our region to pair with you know, damn near anything that we're going to cook. Yeah, I love this comment here from Mike uh, Wilkie. Uh, he says, not only is the wine you have with your barbecue important, but I always make sure the wine I'm drinking while cooking is good. And that, oh, duh. Yeah, so, hell yeah. yeah, absolutely. You, you got to, that's what I'm saying. If anything, just open go ahead. two bottles per person as soon as people get there. Yeah, that's a rule yeah. for, for barbecue. For this weekend, everybody, if you're going to walk away with anything, the rule of thumb is two bottles per person if they're coming over for a queue. And that, don't feel bad if you don't finish them because you can use it for cooking wine later. Exactly. <laughs> No, you don't have to finish them all. Just open that menu. Yeah. Yeah, because then people have a choice. They have. They can sample. They can mess yeah. around. Yeah. You use what's left over for your red wine reduction or your marinade or whatever. No. You want to do. Yeah. Whatever. So I want to know too. Is is do you have though? So we've talked about sauces and the like. But what about a rub? Is there a go-to rub when it comes to? And let's talk about the rub process as well, so everybody is clear on on when to rub do we pat it dry do we not do we put olive oil do we not but let's talk about that real quick and then what rub is going to be the most let's just say wine simply wine friendly rub or do you have a go-to uh bridget let's start with you i'm gonna i'm gonna throw to jeff on this because okay. i don't um i honestly the only rub that i have flipped out over and would go back tomorrow is um at met in memphis the dry rub ribs at Charlie Virgo's Rendezvous in Memphis. And if I could have those, um, that makes me very, very happy. But in general, I don't do that because I'm not a rub person. I'm a griller. I'm, I'm marinating, drying, and then grilling naked. 
well, not me, but you know. Wow. So you just mentioned La Rendezvous restaurant in Memphis. Yes. That was one of my first, first barbecue experiences. Uh, and I brought a bottle of Paso wine to Memphis and I'm walking up and down Beale Street trying to convince the people in the restaurant to let me bring in this bottle. And, and in the restaurant world in California, we have something called corkage fee. And I just want to drink this bottle of wine from 1978, the year of my sister's birth. And we were there for her wedding anniversary and nobody understood the concept of, hey, we have wine here. What? No, you don't need, we, no, no. But I went to La Rendezvous and I said, man, we'll order anything that you want uh, that we need to, but can we open this wine here? And you're like, yeah, sure. And we were able to enjoy a bottle of uh, Paso wine at La Rendezvous and enjoyed some of the most amazing barbecue. All the more reason to go visit Charlie Burgos's rendezvous in Memphis. So going to so going to Rubs, um, I got to tell you that my first choice is going to be the house rub that we make here at, at Jeffrey's. Uh, we call it Jeffrey Spice. Uh, that was uh, a term that one of my sous chef coined back in the day. Um, when it comes to a good rub, it, it's important, and I think for me the defining differences are sugar or no sugar my rub doesn't contain sugar uh, every rub in america consists of the same ingredients for the most part but it's all about ratio uh, so for instance our house rub here is made with salt uh, black pepper granulated garlic and paprika there's four ingredients in it my rub is paprika dominant, uh, whereas if you were to go to, let's say, Suzy Q, that's a that's a big rub producer here on the Central Coast, and they're kind of a, a staple for tri-tip barbecue. They have more of the uh, garlic. They have a little bit of parsley in there. Uh, but for me, a lot of rubs use sugar in it, and I, they use that to kind of help with the caramelization process. Yeah. And so I understand the use of sugar, but all most barbecue sauces contain a lot of sugar so i intentionally created our rub to be an all-purpose rub you, it goes great on pork uh, beef chicken uh, potato chips uh, anything we, we use our rub is our all-purpose rub and it doesn't contain sugar because we're going to get enough sweetness from the sauce yeah and i totally i totally agree with you you don't want sugar in there because you could end up burning it and um, you yep. don't want that and if you want sugar you can put a little bit of it on there but a lot of store-bought you know a lot of store-bought commercial rubs do contain sugar and it is a popular ingredient but uh you know i i think your best bet if you're home style which we we're calling it the barbecue daddies at home you know doing what they do uh go to your spice rack man just create your own rub uh it's really hard to it's really hard to screw up but it's also really hard to master so you can make a lot of really master and actually meathead doesn't put salt in his rub because he wants you to salt it to your your desires rather than have uh, salt in the rub, which means you'd have to know the ratio of salt to the other ingredients in the rub to make sure that you didn't over or under salt it. So that's get you, of course, know what's in your rub. And so you can work with that. Yeah, it's, it's important when it comes to, you know, when you're seasoning, you know, your meat, there's a lot of folks that will say that you don't want to season it too early, it will draw out too much moisture. Uh, there is a specific timing game on what you're looking at. You, you very rarely, if ever, put salt in your marinade. Um, but, you know, so, some folks will do it and it can work, but you, there's a there's a, a tricky balance that you have to keep your eye on. I also, do, I also do a lot of dry brining which is, you can put other stuff in there, but it's basically salt. And it is controversial to salt before you cook because a lot of people feel that it draws out too much moisture, but it also dries out the surface of the protein so that you get a better sear on it. Yeah, get and, that caramelization going, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the thing about barbecue, is for, for me, and, and one of my favorite things about it, why we decided to open a, a barbecue restaurant coming from a Mediterranean background. Uh, you know, I, I got my start as a as a Mediterranean influenced chef. Uh, you know, preparing dishes. I'm heavily influenced in Spain, Italy, France, Germany. Uh, you know, the wine producing region, California. The wine producing regions of the world also know how to eat really, really well. Uh, but ultimately, barbecue, and specifically American barbecue, is 
it's one of the only, it might be the only truly native cuisines in, in America. Nobody really does a barbecue sauce, the ketchup based, uh, smoky, sweet barbecue sauce. Uh, that, that style is not really in any other cuisine in the world. It's, it's really an authentic uh, American dish. And for me uh, and my wife, when we decided to, the time was come to, to take our catering business to the next level and, and get a restaurant uh, together, uh, you know, you go to San Luis Obispo and there's a barbecue restaurant on, on every other corner. And a lot of the Cal Poly guys had it as their senior projects uh, because it's, it's so darn good, man. So, so for me, it came down to the fact that we didn't really have a, a quality barbecue restaurant, a chef-driven barbecue restaurant in, in our community. And our location afforded us an opportunity to have our smokers up, uh, let you guys in on another little uh, re somewhat controversial secret. But uh, I think the controversy is going away because the food is good. We smoke all of our meats. My whole restaurant is based on five Traeger smokers. So it's wood pellet, low and slow barbecue. Uh, when you go to Texas and they're using uh, actual wood, well, here in, here in California, it's really, really controversial and it's really difficult to be able to uh, get yourself set up uh, with outdoor smokers and to be able to, you know, if we were using this, using wood, it, yeah, it, it would, it's really, really difficult. So these Traeger smokers afford us an opportunity to get the fantastic traditional barbecue flavor, the wood fire smoke flavor, but I'm also able to set it and forget it, so to speak, go back into our kitchen, create all of our sauces. Uh, you know, that, that's their thing about the professional world versus the, the home cook. When you're home barbecuing, there's nothing better than standing around the queue. You got your beer, you're, you're flipping your meat every now and again, you're, you're talking to your buddies, you're, you're hanging out. That's a, such a communal experience. But uh, when you're doing a professional level, we want to make sure that uh, it's consistent every single time. And I've learned to, to master the blend. So we use cherry, oak, hickory, and maple in our, in our wood pellets. And uh, we get a nice consistent. I, I like to consider that my uh, wood pellets are similar to maybe Tyler's barrel program. You know, every winemaker is going to have a, a different uh, barrel program. And it's going to provide little nuances in the flavor that make it uniquely mm -hmm. theirs. And that's the kind of way I look at my barbecue. There's well, three parts just, around the world. But. It's not just professionals that benefit from those. I, I have a pellet grill that Meathead sent me when we started this most recent project. And I love my, my pellet grills. Sadly, not a Traeger, but it's a camp chef and it's really nice. And I love the idea of blending the different types of pellets. But it is true. Set it and forget it. And you can do your reverse sear out there. Get a nice smoke on an entire filet for instance, 4th of July, hello. Get it, a whole filet, smoke, cold smoke it or low temperature smoke it with some nice pellets out there, set it and forget it. And then when I'm done, I actually cheat and bring it in and sear it in butter because then I can get even better Maillard reaction because of the, so the milk solids in the butter on the outside of my whole filet. And then you chill it down so it doesn't cook too much. And then when you slice it, you get this rosy, rosy pink, gorgeous thing. Yeah. Tyler, do you How have do you chill it down? Things? What do you do? Um, cool it off as fast as you can and then put it in the fridge. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question was, was uh, Tyler, you know, a lot of winemaker buddies have excess barrels or excess staves. You ever use your wine barrel staves or, uh, or any root stock in, in your grilling? Uh, yeah, sometimes we'll use the barrel staves. The white oak tends to burn pretty fast. It gets real hot. So sometimes maybe just before we're going to put some meat on the grill or whatever, we want to heat it up and, and it's going to be a quick sear. We'll throw a couple and let those turn to coals and you're good to go. But they do burn pretty fast. Uh, so what I, I do use them too, to sometimes if I'm going to do a lot of red oak, because I use them to start the fire because they, they light up pretty easy. And so you a little TP of, of broken barrel staves. I just crush them with my foot and and then you get that going and you can start stoking it then with some red oak pieces and get gradually bigger. And then eventually, in a, you know, a couple hours, you got a beautiful bed of coals of red oak. And so we use them just not like, they just burn too fast otherwise. Right. Wine, the wine stain of them doesn't do anything as far as impart flavors or anything like that. I mean, that. by the time you're putting food over it, that's coals and a lot of that's all burnt off. You yeah. don't really do, I don't really do like active flame too much just because 
you could burn things and it just or, or it gets real smoky kind of and you get like that gray hue on your meat or whatever your chicken mm-hmm. or whatever so I, I wait till it's a better complete bed of coals before i start using it yeah. and you guys believe it but we've been talking for an hour <laughs> and, and uh and it's it's always fun to talk about food it's always fun to talk about wine mostly food this time around on pass a wine hour uh, but uh, I, before we close out this show, though, I want to go around real quick and find out what are you cooking this weekend and what do you think you're going to drink with it? I mean, Tyler's going to open, of course, multiple bottles, but we're going to start with Tyler. And it, are you are you going to queue this weekend? Are you going to grill? And, and I, so what do you do? Yeah, for me, it'll be about the kids, though. So there probably won't be multiple bottles. So it'll be hamburgers and hot dogs and whole years of corn with the husk still on and um we'll i'll probably grill some sausages and a couple other things it's just kind of a smorgasbord again i think yeah fourth of july this year it's all about the kiddos so it's kind of whatever they'll eat and whatever i'll eat anything so yeah it's, it'll be more tradi- classic traditional i think uh american grilling yeah yeah Jeff, when you're when you're not at work, I mean, and you're because you might be working, I don't know, this this July 4th, I don't know if you're open or not. But if you're not at work, but you're at home and you're gonna grill something, are you grilling something different? Yeah. Something yeah. Different? Uh so fourth of July is really important to us here at the restaurant. Uh, we opened on Father's Day weekend. And when we opened, our goal was to be a seven day a week operation uh, for the community for the most part. And after about two and a half weeks of that, we realized that is insane and we're not going to be able to do that. So in 2018, 4th of July fell on a Wednesday and that was the first day that we decided to close. Uh, And so to this day, we still close on on Wednesdays. Uh, Although 4th of July is falling on a Sunday this year and as much as we love our community, uh, we're going to close. Uh, We're going to close for for our own benefit. Uh, for the staff and uh, my wife and I live in downtown Templeton and uh, if anyone's familiar with downtown Templeton 4th of July is like a picture straight out of a Norman Rockwell you know painting Uh, we have uh, where we live we have the parade go right by our house Uh, so we're going to close the restaurant on 4th of July and we're having a little get together so if anybody's watching uh, and you're out cruising around uh, check out downtown Templeton we'll be there one of my favorite things to cook uh, at home, we don't do it here at the restaurant, uh, but I'll be cooking it this 4th of July and I did it the other day, uh, is whole smoked New York strip loin. So we took a, treat it very similar to the way you would prime rib, but uh, I took a whole strip loin, heavily seasoned it, heavily seasoned it in salt, uh, granulated garlic and black pepper. And then I put that on the smoker uh, 225 degrees. Uh, someone had asked a question earlier, but, uh, in the comment section, but yeah, 225. That's, that's kind of your golden number for smoking meats. Smoke your, uh, smoke your, your New York strip loin, uh, internal temperature. I'm looking for about 125 degrees and then I'll pull that off. I'll let it rest. And then I'll get a really hot cast iron pan ready and I'll start slicing it. And then you can have it as like a prime rib style, you know, nice and, and uh, you know, rare, medium rare in the middle. Or what I like to do is take that smoked strip loin and then drop it on my cast iron pan really quick just to get a quick char on the outside. So when you cut into it, it has this great flavor taste of a prime rib style, low and slow cooked, but you get this great char on the outside. Uh, Tyler mentioned earlier, uh, uh, chimichurri. Uh, if when I'm cooking at the house, I want to have chimichurri. I want to have a horseradish cream sauce. I want to have a blue cheese butter. Uh, I love the romesco idea. He also mentioned that earlier. I love uh, romesco sauce with pork specifically. But uh, my go-to sauces on all my smoked meats are are chimichurri, horseradish cream sauce, blue cheese butter, maybe a little garlic or butter. You know, like Bridget had mentioned, anytime you could take a piece of meat. Heck, before you sear it, you could drop it in some melted butter and then get your sear on it. Uh, mm-hmm. Calories, you don't, don't count calories on 4th of July. Uh, count to pride in America, count, you know, hang out with the family, <laughs> with the kiddos. Uh, that's what it's all about for me. Awesome, awesome. Bridget, what are you doing this weekend? I'm gonna do quail on the rotisserie. Oh. So 
you get the quail from JNR. I ordered 20 of them. The recipe is actually in this book, which some locals may have seen around the tasting rooms. It's all about this, this area. Um, so you basically put quail on the rotisserie, but in between each quail, you put a big slice of sourdough bread, which you have mm. kind of dredged in olive oil, garlic, herbs, and stuff. And so you're creating a quail and a crouton, and a quail and a crouton, and a quail and a crouton. And as they go around on the rotisserie, they look like little rockets, you know, with the legs kind of flipping around. And then you serve each person a quail and a crouton, slapping on top of the crouton, and it's all crunchy. I think there may be a little bit of a butter thing going on with the croutons, just to make sure that they get nice and golden. So that's what we're doing. We're doing the quail rockets. Awesome. And if you're getting it from JNR Meats, it's probably going to be a local quail of some sort. Couldn't yeah. get more Californian than quail. Absolutely <laughs> not. It, it's, it, I think it's our California state bird, too. So. Yeah, when we're not eating them, we're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're appreciating them as they yeah. scurry across the road. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you That's great. Sure. So to, to find out more, Bridget, about you, about these cookbooks, where do, where do we go? Uh, BridgetBins.com, B-R-I-G-I-T-B-I-N-N-S.com. Excellent, excellent. And then Jeffrey, as far as for people to, to learn more about the restaurant and about you, where are they going? We're going to go right here to this tri-tip sandwich. And then you're going to come down the alley, uh, downtown Paso. You can check us out at uh, Jeffrey'sWineCountryBarbecue.com. Uh, I'd say follow us on social media. Uh, my wife and I manage it ourselves. Uh, she is the queen of Instagram, and I run the Old Man Facebook page. And uh, we're, we're always able to check out our, our videos. Uh, every Sunday, we do a, a paella video. Again, it's kind of a, a little bit of a nod to the Spanish style of barbecue. But uh, uh, I want to raise a glass to, to everybody and say, you know, come come see us. Uh, not on Fourth of July, but enjoy your Fourth of July holiday. <laughs> Cheers. And Tyler, what what are you cooking? What are you what are you doing? What are you? Oh, well, as I mentioned, I'm just. Oh wait, you you you're cooking. Kids, That's yeah. right, you're cooking the yeah kids. But but let's yeah. let's. How do we learn more about you? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, just Google search Nell and Corden Wineries, and you can learn everything you want to know right there. And then if you see what you like, book a tasting next time you're in town and come see us. All right, and then how do we tap into? Because I know you cook sometimes over there. Is that just the luck of the draw? Uh, you just have to catch me on the right day, but it, it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't do, I might say no, that's all. I'd hate to huh? go without mentioning the brisket mac and cheese at, at Jeff's place because it's, it's comfort food um, on steroids. It's what you need when you need something and you're not sure what it is. Absolutely. It is. It's, that stuff is really, really good. It's all, also, I got to tell you, the lobster mac and cheese... <laughs> Dude, dude, that's so. Good. Uh, anyway, <laughs> also barbecue, meat, barbecue meats and mac and cheese, paella, beer and wine, good music. That that's what this yeah. holiday is all about. Yeah. And that's what we are all about. Happy times, happy times. We're lucky to be here. For Amen. sure. So everyone, thank you so much for hanging out with us. We went a little long today, but uh, happy Fourth of July to all of you. Paso Wine Hour should be back next week. I think it will be back next week again uh, because we uh, we have a show that, we're, that, that we've formulated about decanting wine that uh, we're waiting on a guest uh, that uh, we, we need to find out their schedule. And so that being said, thanks everyone. Have a great Fourth of July. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you, Chris. Oh. Thank you for bringing us together. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers, everyone. I'll be queuing this weekend as well with 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 some friends yeah. and family and enjoying some really good wines. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Yay.